I'm very pleased to be here this evening. And as a veteran of 25 years in the federal system, I feel uniquely qualified to speak to you on the subject of mass incarceration, social justice, and how to rebuild the black community. I think I'm supposed to be clicking as I go along so that you can follow along. Here we are. That's much better. Mass incarceration and social justice has become the new issues of our time. It is truly the civil rights issue of our time. If Martin Luther King were alive, Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, Medgar Evers, they would be involved in I Can't Breathe, Black Lives Matter, because this is the new civil rights issue of our time. When you talk about social justice in America, you have to talk about social injustice. Because from the time Africans landed in America, they have never truly had social justice. From the time the first slave set a foot on the soil of America, through the strangulation of Eric Gardner, the shooting of Mike Brown, and the death of Trayvon Martin, there has been no social justice. Mass incarceration is an outgrowth of this social injustice. Because after slavery, a system had to be constructed that would contain these newly freed people who many felt had no right to freedom or justice, had no right to basic human rights. So the system of mass incarceration evolved into its present incarnation, an $80 billion a year industry. So what we are going to consider tonight is not just the problem of social injustice, the struggle against mass incarceration, but how we can successfully move ourselves forward. We're going to discuss solutions. And above all, we're going to discuss the responsibility of the black community and how we can rebuild it. Because whenever we talk about racial discrimination, oppression, the entrenched systems of discrimination, there are two sides of this. There are the forces that are outside, pressing downward, and then there are those that are inside. And those that are inside are the ones that we can control, the ones that we can move forward, the ones that we can use as a foundation in this struggle. Social justice, when you speak of social justice, we're talking about centuries of discrimination, bias in treatment, structural racism, housing segregation, fragmented social networks, economic and educational injustice, inferior community institutions, and dysfunctional behaviors and group practices. Issues. When we talk about structural racism, bias and treatment, these are the barriers that we face as a people. These are the barriers that the system has put in place. It is illogical for us as a people to look to the system to rectify ills that they have created. So it is incumbent upon us as a community to face these issues and move them forward. Housing segregation in many areas of America, it is just as segregated now as it was 40, 50 years ago. But now segregation is by class because you can't afford to move in these neighborhoods or neighborhoods keep themselves one ethnic group. But it is still segregation. Economic and educational injustice occurs when people have the lack of opportunity and they cannot move forward. And this is something that has to be remedied. Inferior community institutions can be seen across the board in urban areas when our schools are crumbling or our schools are closing. In the city of Philadelphia, they closed 23 schools, while at the same time, the state was allocating $400 million for the Phoenix 1 and 2 
prisons in Montgomery County, clearly saying that we value incarceration over education and sending a clear message to the black community that we are closing your schools and we are expanding the prison system because we know what happens when people are uneducated, when they are desperate, when they have no hope. That was clearly seen recently right here in Philadelphia when two desperate young men tried to rob a, a GameStop and killed a Philadelphia police officer. Social injustice leads to dysfunctional behaviors. That was an example of a dysfunctional behavior. You are robbing a store in your own neighborhood. You are robbing a store in a snowstorm where your tracks are easily visible. You are robbing a store and you walk into the store and there's a policeman there and you engage in a Wild West shootout. That is dysfunctional. And those sort of behaviors have to be addressed in our community and we're gonna speak more about that as we move on. Mass incarceration. What does mass incarceration really mean to the black community? What does it mean to black America? What is the reality of mass incarceration? Mass incarceration has many faces and the first faces are people. Mass incarceration is not just a man being stopped and frisked handcuffed and thrown into the back of a police car. Someone standing in front of a judge and being sentenced. Or being loaded into vans that look like many slave ships and then shipped off across the state or across the country. Mass incarceration is a little boy or girl crying themselves to sleep because their father's not there. And they have no hope that he will ever be there. We have a student in our after school program whose father's doing life. He has no hope of ever holding his father, playing with his father, having his father in his life, in his lifetime. Because in Pennsylvania, life means life. When you receive those letters, your life is effectively over. So we don't call it a life sentence. We call it death by incarceration. Economics. I spoke of the fact that the system of mass incarceration is an 80 billion dollar a year industry what that means is when manufacturing left our shores for third world countries a new economy was needed so in many rural towns prison is the new economy and the folks in that town work in the prison and the vendors sell electricity and water and all manner of goods to that prison prison is the industry that powers many towns in our society. And what that means is that now justice is for sale. Especially when it comes to private prisons who have contracts where 80 to 90 percent occupancy is mandated. And we've seen evidence of this in Luzerne County in 2009 when judges were actually selling kids to the system. Our system of social justice has been co-opted by finances. So what is the responsibility of the black community in the fight for social justice, the struggle against mass incarceration, and the struggle to rebuild our community? Mass incarceration is so vast that this stat is astounding. In the census of 1860, there were 3,953,696 slaves in the Lower South. That was the count. But today, in our system of mass incarceration, when you count state, federal, local, halfway houses, persons on parole and on probation, there are 6,937,600 persons in the system of mass incarceration. That is a vast amount. To think that in 2015 there would be almost 3 million more people in mass incarceration here in this country than were slaves in this country is a terrible statistic. But that is the reality of mass incarceration. As a community, we have to face that. We have to face the fact that the system is broken and it is up to us to move forward. 
there is a wonderful book that should be required reading for all black Americans and any conscious thinking person who is serious about dealing with the solutions to social justice and mass incarceration. And it's by Dr. Amy L. Wax. It's a wonderful book. I've been reading it, studying it. An important book was written several years ago by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. And what that book did was illuminate the minds of people to the reality of the system of mass incarceration and how they are second class citizens that were created by this. What Michelle Alexander did was groundbreaking in the sense that she opened the door on the conversation that the black community has been having for many, many years and spread it across America. And in churches, in groups and organizations, folks are reading the new Jim Crow, it's opening their minds and they're saying, we have to do something about this. What Amy Wax has done in the book, Race, Wrongs and Remedies, is outline a concise argument and talk about what the black community needs to do to move forward in this struggle. And I fully concur with many of the things that she says. She talks about barriers, structural barriers that we've just discussed. All the things that I've just talked about are these structural barriers, racial discrimination, housing, lack of opportunity in jobs and education. These are the barriers. But there are also hard struggles. And the hard struggles are the things that the black community has to do to attack these barriers within and without. Low educational attainment. We have to value education as a people. And what this means is valuing small things like doing homework. In our after school program at the Center for Returning Citizens, we see that many times it is difficult for parents to help kids with their homework. They may not have the knowledge, but they need to send them to places like ours so that their kids can get their homework done every day. Go to bed at night. Make sure the kids are in school every day and not being truant. These are things that we can do. Poor socialization skills and work habits. In our program where we are sending people out in the community to find jobs, we stress that you have to socialize on your job. You have to be a person who your employer wants to employ. You have to bring value and benefit to the workplace and you have to have the skills necessary to maintain employment. You have to be there on time every day and work hard all day. That's how you bring value to your workplace. Drug use, high crime rates. We cannot tolerate crime in our community on the level that it is. When a person is murdered in our community, when there's open drug dealing in our community and we turn a blind, blind eye to it, we give the police license to occupy our communities like they are war zones. And then we cannot really complain when black youths are slain because of the environment that they've created by their criminal activities. But as elders, as parents, as families of these young men, we must mentor them. We must create an atmosphere where they have to put community first, and then family, and then the individual. That is the Afrocentric way. That is the way of our ancestors, and we have to get back to these paths. Low marriage rate, child abandonment, single parent households. These are discussions that we have to have in the black community. When we have over 60% of our households headed by single mothers, that means that they have a very difficult time raising the young. A black father in a home is essential. A black father can teach a black son how to be a black male in America, and that's a distinctly different task than any other race in America. Being a young black male in America is arduous. It's a struggle, and he needs his father there to teach him that. A black father should be teaching their daughters that they are the daughters of life itself, that you should be loved and respected and no one should ever abuse you. A young black woman should be looking for a male who loves her and honors and respects her in the same way that her father did as she was growing up. If her father's not there, she misses that experience and her life can become very traumatic. Poor use 
and development skills, poor planning, strategic thinking. Many cultural groups think long range. In order for us to move forward as a community, we have to plan 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road and put those plans into place on a daily basis. You set long-term goals and short-term goals, incremental goals, so that you can move forward, and you have to do it in an organized way, which means a political power, voting. In the city of Philadelphia, there's over 300,000 returning citizens, persons who have returned home from prisons, yet we do not impact the system because we don't vote, we don't organize, we don't run anything but our mouths. It is essential for us to put aside petty differences and move forward in a united fashion so when we attack the political system, we can demand what's necessary by force of our numbers. The only way we can do this is by thinking in an organized direction. And we are moving in that direction. And we encourage those with a like mind to move forward with us. So what we are saying in conclusion is in order for us to effectively correct social injustice, we have to be organized. We have to be united. In order to attack the system of mass incarceration, we have to look to its roots. When you talk about crime, you have to attack the sources of crime, the reasons for crime. You have to get out into the neighborhoods and interact with the young people and create opportunities so that they have alternatives to crime. In order for our organization to get young black men off the streets, we have to have manufacturing, we have to have warehouse jobs, we have to have apprenticeships to put them in as an alternative. We have to rebuild the family structure. We have to revitalize our families. We have to take responsibility as black fathers and say, I'm going to be with one woman, honor and respect her. I'm going to raise my children. I'm going to build my community. And this is what my foundation is. I'm not protesting and marching. I'm building. I am establishing a foundation for myself for my family, for my children, my grandchildren, and all future generations to come. This is the task. This is the call to action. This is what Martin Luther King would be saying, Malcolm X would be saying, all those who fought in the past for the right to vote, the right to be free, the right to exist, would be standing here with us and moving forward. We are in their place. We must set the tone. So that when future generations look back on this day, they say they were the people that created what our lives are today.